Mark, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I know you're busy and probably a lot of people are emailing you right now. I've been following your stuff for a while, uh, specifically on uh, economic theories and your outlook on what's happening in the world. And right now we are at a precipice. We're at an interesting time where we're in uncharted territories. We have many different things happening. We have a pandemic, a viral pandemic. We have oil wars. We have more or less MMMT, uh, modern monetary theory being implemented. And based on all your knowledge and your experience of writing about this, <laughs> you know, this is a big question, but, you know, what's your take on this? Like, do you have any theses? Uh, where do you think we're heading from here? Yes. I mean, uh, I'd like to clarify one point. I have experience about this from reading books and studies and papers. But personally, I have never experienced a complete breakdown simultaneously of economic activity and asset markets and all asset markets to the extent we had it within one month. Normally, a bear market in the magnitude we had and with the destruction of assets we had takes maybe two years but we had it in one month yeah and uh, then obviously the question is you know is this a decline like we had many declines in 2018 until the end of december and we had the Nasdaq break after 2000 and the financial crisis. And so is this kind of a break where asset prices will after a while go up again and to higher levels? And unfortunately, I have to say that I doubt that will go back to the asset levels or to the levels they were a month ago anytime soon. I would refrain from say, saying uh, ever again, but a lot of stocks will no longer be uh, at those levels and a lot of losses will have been uh, taken and uh, a lot of people will have lost maybe everything. You understand? It's a serious situation and even if they print money and even if the virus is over tomorrow, until confidence comes back entirely, it will take a long time. And for now, I can say, you know, two weeks ago in America, some economists, including Goldman Sachs, said, oh, the economy is slowing down and uh, we have revised uh, economic growth for 2020 to 2% or something like this. But corporate profits forecasts they were still at over $170 for the S&P. And my view is that corporate profits, the way it looks now, will tumble minimum, and I'm saying minimum 50%. And if the corporate profits tumble by, say, 50%, some would say maybe 30%, but even 30%, and this would be an optimistic outlook, then stocks today are no cheaper than they were a month ago because a month ago the earnings were, say, at 100 and now they're down to 70, in my view, down to 50. So you understand, as stocks came down, the earnings also came down. And so I wouldn't say that stocks are very cheap at the present time. And the market, yes, is very oversold. This is... a uh, I've seen this oversold market maybe once in 1987. On the other occasions, it never got this oversold. But I just like to say, I've also seen markets that became extremely overbought. Uh, like in 82, in August 82, September 82. But then they didn't correct on the downside. They moved sideways for a while, and then they shot up again. And I'm afraid that we're in a situation where the market is very oversold, but may not rebound very much, and could move sideways a bit before it 
we tank again to lower levels. And it's interesting. I have a lot of subscribers and people who send me emails about what not. None of the emails that I received asked me whether it was a good time to reduce stock positions. All the emails I received, all of them, without an exception, asked me whether they should buy stocks now or buy more and so forth. So the frame of mind of investors is more like they are afraid of missing a rally, not yeah. of a major decline that extends much lower. I'm more interested in also, I just saw recently that the Fed is doing a trillion dollars a day in repo. They're printing. <laughs> it's worth, I couldn't even believe it. I'm like, here we go. <laughs> Just turn on the machines. <laughs> and uh, you're right. Everything's oversold. Since 2008, the stocks are oversold. Everybody that got a bailout in 2008 were just doing stock buybacks, propagating the value of their stock. It's all thin air. It's all paper value. And I'm more interested in is do you see or do we see or do you think there's a possibility of in inflation with the dollar? And do you think that? Anytime soon, trust will come back to investors to see uh, whether there's a bond. Because the biggest problem right now is price discovery and confidence in an asset. People don't have confidence in the stock market right now. Even gold was selling off, li liquidating for cash. So I'm curious, do you have any thesis on that? Well, for now, we have a demand deficiency, obviously, because uh, as you know, People, if they stay home, they may not have a salary. Yes. Like I live in Thailand. Okay. In Thailand, tourism is 20% of the economy. And it employs probably about 2 million people in the tourism uh, sector. In other words, hotels, restaurants, travel agents, uh, uh, guides, and so forth. And these people... They have nothing to do at the moment because there's no tourism. Nobody comes to Thailand uh, because nobody wants to be quarantined right away at the mm -hmm. airport. Mm -hmm. It's like I live in Thailand. I'm not going to go anywhere because I'm not sure I can come back. So it paralyzes the whole economy. Now, whether it's necessary or not, I'm not so sure. I think maybe the governments are overdoing it. And I am skeptical of any government action. I always think whatever they do, they fuck up. So uh, maybe they overdid it and maybe they exaggerated the problem. But the reality is business is dead. If you look at picture of uh, Park Avenue in New York or Times Square or Zurich, the station or Grand Central in New York or the airport, the airport in Thailand, or if I go out of my house, which I still do, the streets are empty. The bars have all been closed. It's a major disaster for me. Yeah, like they're talking about right now airdropping everybody, like a universal basic income. And it's funny that you said earlier, yeah, the government fucked up everything. The reason we're in this mess is because of them to begin with. And it's funny that people think that they're going to be the ones that fix everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is the funniest. I <laughs> A lot of the problem arose because of their ill-conceived policies, especially after 2000, we had the first crisis, then they kept interest rates artificially low, and there were clowns and comedians like Paul Krugman, oh my who God. said you know, it would be good to have another bubble, and yeah. Yellen agreed, and Bernanke agreed. So, yeah, I mean, you can't actually do business with people like that. They are very dangerous for the entire system. And they created the first problem, the great financial crisis. What did they learn? FS, nothing. They offered doubled down on their bubble creation and created superseding the housing bubble, another <laughs> financial bubble with more debt. When the debt problem brought about the great financial crisis in the first place, they piled on even more debt uh, 
to create this problem. Now, the coronavirus is, a, is an issue, but you understand, in a normal economic system, in a healthy system, it wouldn't create this kind of wreckage. And uh, you, of course, the politicians and the central bankers will blame coronavirus for everything. But the rot, uh, the dirt in the financial system and the political system was there before. But this we all know. Only the politicians and the central bankers will deny it. The question is, you know, where do we go from here? And as I said, I'm not very optimistic. I think I wrote a report a year ago that uh, the asset inflation is coming to an end. Because as you know, inflation is a very difficult concept to define. We can have inflation in wages and we can have inflation in commodities and in food and we can have inflation in asset prices such as we had in the last 20, 30 years. And this asset inflation uh, was very pronounced. And it is possible that now essentially all asset prices will come down. I mean, I've been a bit surprised that gold came off this much. But in a credit contraction, you know, in a debt deflation, this has been described by Irving Fisher in his book, The De Debt Deflation Theory. In a debt deflation, everything goes down. Yes. Whereby probably gold will not go down by 90%, whereas many stocks will go down by 90%. Yeah, silver took a big yeah, hit some too. Some have actually already gone down by 90%. <laughs> Yeah, it was a liquidation crisis. Everyone's liquidating. Cash is king right now. I'm trying to figure out the bottom. Well, it depends, you know, what is the leverage in the system? And I'm afraid that a lot of investors leveraged their portfolios mm -hmm. for the following reason. Let me explain. Mm -hmm. Say, you and I, 20 years ago, we have a portfolio. Mm -hmm. You're more aggressive, you invest 70% in stocks and 30% in bonds. I'm more conservative, I have 70% in bonds and 30% in stocks. Now, if there is a market decline, the stocks go down and the bonds, because at that time, 20 years ago, the profile of bonds was a higher quality than it is today. The bonds may have gone down somewhat. But they were yielding maybe 6 8%. You understand? Today's bonds are yielding 3 or 4%, the lower quality bonds. Well, now the yield has shot up because the price of the bonds went down. But the point I want to make 20 years ago or so, if we had a big setback in our stock portfolio, the bond portfolio gave us some... Uh, cash flow mm -hmm. that allowed us to buy more shares when they were depressed or, or after the decline. Nowadays, the problem was that bond yields were very low. Again, the government has created this artificial low interest rate with, in many countries, negative interest rates. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you have your portfolio of, say, 70% stocks and 30% bonds, the bonds give you no cash flow. So when your stock portfolio goes down, you don't have the cash flow to buy more. Number two, the friendly brokers and private bankers, they went to the clients and said, yeah, we know the yields are very disappointing for you, 4% or 3% or whatnot on these bonds. But hello, the borrowing rate is so low you can borrow money, you have a bond, you leverage it to, say, 80%, it yields 4%, you borrow money at 2%, and that boosts your return to maybe 10% or more, if everything goes well. You know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now that the bonds have gone down, the friendly private 
bankers that have only your interest in mind, not theirs. They call you and say, we have a margin call for margin your account. Yeah. You have to put up more margin or we have to sell you out. Yeah, yeah. And that, and that you can multiply among millions of investors and among hedge funds. And I think the Fed, with their liquidity injections, couldn't care less about the small man on the street. Don't no. ever think that. The government is not concerned. The government is concerned about getting the votes, but couldn't care less about the feelings and the hardship of ordinary people. But their bodies at hedge funds and at Goldman Sachs and at Citigroup and, and all the banks, that is in their interest to bail them out. Of course, they're getting 0% loans. Regular people aren't getting any help. They're talking about UBI, which is going to come with a lot of stipulations, a lot of stipulations. And the lifeblood of the free market, the entrepreneurs who provide the most jobs, who provide real value <laughs> products, they get fucked. I don't get any cheap loans. I don't get any support. I get nothing. And so and hopefully this is some wake-up call to some people to realize how badly our system is skewed. People blame this on capitalism. I'm like, I wish this is not capitalism. This is corporatism. This is the biggest rigged system of all time. It's not a free market. It's crony capitalism. Correct. It's a, a travesty to call this a market economy or a capitalistic system. This is a completely rigged beep, uh, uh, system by essentially, yeah, I'd say vicious people, vicious people. Yeah, I agree. And so do you, do you have like any advice for anybody out there who's planning to kind of strategize what to do? Should they just sit and wait right now to have some cash or like, well, what, what's your advice for people? I think for the last, 30, 40 years, precisely since 1982, uh, the mentality of the public became gradually geared towards thinking how to maximize my capital gains in stocks, in bonds, in commodities, in gold, in silver, in real estate. In other words, uh, there was a strong greed element. Mm -hmm. and partly understandable because the wages didn't go up. The ordinary person could not make ends meet. He had to either borrow money or supplement his income by speculating, you know, either through the appreciation of the house or whatever. Mm -hmm. But from his ordinary income, which has been stagnating for the last 30 years or so, he couldn't live mm -hmm. properly. Especially not if he had children, and especially not if he had a divorce. Mm -hmm. That was the killer. So these people were geared towards uh, investing and speculating. I think now uh, the investor number one priority is what is the worst possible case? Okay, the worst possible case is a stock market decline, as I've seen on numerous occasions, of 90%. That is the worst possible case. And the bond market could be the default rate, not among government bonds, they'll pay for the time being, but eventually, who knows? For the time being, they will pay. Not much, but they will pay. But the corporate bond market, I wouldn't be surprised if the default rate is 30%. Mm. You know, it's possible. Mm. And in 2008, and also uh, before that in 2003, corporate bonds tanked in value. They tanked recently. In other words, if you look at uh, bond ETFs like HIG, Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a high yield bond ETF, HYG, and uh, EMB, that's the Emerging Market Bond ETF. They've plunged, but 
they may go lower you understand the situation could get out of hand in this deleveraging process and so i think anyone as an investor i would tell him look i don't think you should play here or right here uh, you should consider what is the worst outcome and can you afford the worst outcome you understand if you are a billionaire and you lose uh, 900 million it's not pleasant but you can still live well on 100 million sure. maybe not <laughs> five wife, but yeah. i think most people can still live reasonably well but if you have a million and uh, this is for your retirement and uh, you yeah. lose 90 percent it's not a very pleasant experience yeah so I, I think the mindset should change and become, you know, what is the worst case outcome? And I don't mind if the market rebounds, maybe with the 30% or 20% I have in stocks, they'll appreciate, but I don't want to take the risk of losing everything. Yeah, I think that's really, really good advice. I appreciate that, Mark. Mark, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your thoughts and experience. Well, if people I, want... <laughs> <laughs> I'm if sorry, you... I wasn't more optimistic. No, no, no. I, I, it's not about being optimistic. It's about being real and honest and transparent, okay. which you bring to the table. If people want to read more about you, what's the best resource for them to check out? Well, they can Google my name, Mark Faber, or they can go to our website gloomboomdoom.com thanks mark i appreciate it well thank you for your time and for the interview bye-bye bye-bye